What's going on, everybody? And welcome to episode nine of the Black Massacre series, where today we will be talking about the Colfax Massacre of 1873. The Colfax Massacre, referred to sometimes as the Colfax Riot, occurred on Easter Sunday, April 13th, 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana, the parish seat of Grant Parish. An estimated 62 to 153 black militia men were murdered while surrendering to a mob of former Confederate soldiers and members of the Ku Klux Klan. Three white men also died during the confrontation. After the contested 1872 election for governor of Louisiana and local offices, a group of white men armed with rifles and a small cannon overpowered black freedmen in state militia occupying the Grant Parish Courthouse in Colfax. Most of the freedmen were killed after surrendering and nearly another 50 were killed later that night after being held as prisoners for several hours. Estimates of the number of dead have varied over the years, ranging from 62 to 153. Three whites died, but the number of black victims was difficult to determine because many bodies were thrown into the Red River or removed for burial, possibly at mass graves. Historian Eric Foner described the massacre as the worst instance of racial violence during the Reconstruction. In Louisiana, it had the most fatalities of any of the numerous violent events occurring after the disputed gubernatorial contest in 1872 between Republicans and Democrats. Foner wrote, Every election in Louisiana between 1868 and 1876 was marked by rampant violence and pervasive fraud. Although the fusionist dominated state returning board, which ruled on vote validity, initially declared John McEnry and his Democratic slate the winners, the winners, the board eventually divided with a faction declaring Republican William P. Kellogg the victor. A Republican federal judge in New Orleans ruled that the Republican majority legislature be seated. Federal prosecution and conviction of a few perpetrators at Colfax by the Enforcement Acts was appealed to the Supreme Court. In a major case, the court ruled in United States versus Krukashank, I'm sorry, Krukashank, 1876 that protections of the 14th Amendment did not apply to persons acting individually, but only to the actions of state governments. After this ruling, the federal government could no longer use the Enforcement Act of 1870 to prosecute actions by paramilitary groups such as the White League, which had chapters forming across Louisiana beginning in 1874. Intimidations, murder, and black voter suppression by such paramilitary groups were instrumental to the Democratic Party regaining political control of the state legislature by the late 1870s. During the late 20th century and early 21st centuries, historians have given renewed attention to the events at Colfax and the resulting Supreme Court case. In March 1865, Unionist planter James Madison Wells became governor. As the Democratic-dominated legislature passed black codes that restricted rights of freemen, Wells began to favor allowing blacks to vote and temporarily disenfranchising ex-Confederates. To accomplish this, he scheduled a new constitutional convention for July 30, 1866. It was postponed because of the New Orleans massacre that day in which armed Southern white Democrats attacked blacks who had a parade in support of the convention. Anticipating trouble, the mayor of New Orleans had asked the local military commander to police the city and protect the convention. The U.S. Army failed to respond promptly to the mayor's request and a group of numerous unarmed blacks was attacked by whites, resulting in 38 deaths, 34 black and 4 white, and more than 40 wounded most of them black. When President Andrew Johnson blamed the massacre on Republican agitation, a popular national reaction against Johnson's policies resulting in national voters electing a majority Republican Congress in 1866. It passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 despite Andrew Johnson's veto. Earlier, the Freedmen's Bureau and the Occupation Armies had prevented Southern Black codes, which had limited the rights of freedmen and other blacks, including their choices of work and living locations, from becoming effective. On July 16, 1866, Congress extended the life of the Freedmen's Bureau, and also despite Johnson's veto. On March 2, 1867, they passed the Reconstruction Act over Johnson's veto, which required that blacks be given the franchise in southern states but not in northern states. 
and that reconstructed southern states ratified the 14th Amendment before admission to the Union. By April 1868, a biracial coalition in Louisiana had elected a Republican majority state legislature, but violence increased before the fall election. Almost all of the victims were black and some white Republicans who were protecting the black Republican freedmen. Insurgents also attacked people physically or burned their homes to discourage them from voting. President Johnson, a Democrat, prevented the Republican governor of Louisiana from using either the state militia or U.S. forces to suppress the insurgent groups, such as the Knights of the White Camellia. The Red River area of Wynn and Rapids parishes was a combination of large plantations and subsistence farmers. Before the war, African Americans had worked as slaves on the plantations. William Smith Calhoun, a major planter, had inherited a 14,000 acre plantation in the area. A former slaveholder, he lived with a mixed race woman as his common law wife and had come to favor black political e equality encouraging the political organization of the local African-American based Republican Party. On Election Day in November 1868, Calhoun led a group of freedmen to vote. The ballot box was originally at a store owned by John Ho, who had threatened to whip freedmen if they voted Republican. Calhoun arranged for the ballot box to move to a plantation store owned by a Republican. In addition, he oversaw the submission of 150 black votes from freedmen of, on his plantation land. The Republicans received 318 votes and the Democrats received 49. A group of whites threw the ballot box into the Red River and Democrats arrested Calhoun alleging election fraud. With the original ballot box gone, Democrat Michael Ryan went on to claim a landslide victory. The election was also marked by violence. Election Commissioner Hal Frazier, a black Republican, was murdered by whites. After this, Calhoun drafted a bill to create a new parish out of parts of Wynn and Rapids parishes, which passed the Republican legislature as a major planter. Calhoun thought he would have more political influence in the new parish, which he had a black majority. Other new parishes were created by the Republican state legislature to try to develop areas of Republican political control. According to Lane, after Ulysses S. Grant became president in 1869, he lobbied hard for the 15th Amendment ratified February 3, 1870, which guaranteed that black men, most of whom were newly freed slaves, would have the right to vote. However, the Ku Klux Klan continued violent attacks and killed scores of blacks in Arkansas, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, and elsewhere. In response, on May 31, 1870, Congress passed an Enforcement Act which prohibited groups of people from banding together to violate citizens' constitutional rights. Soon afterwards, April 20, 1871, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act which Grant used to suspend the writ of habeas corpus and sent federal troops to South Carolina, a state with particularly egregious Klan activity. Governor Henry Clay Warmoth struggled to maintain political balance in Louisiana. Among his appointments, he installed William Ward, a black Union veteran and commanding officer of the company, a 6th Infantry Regiment, Louisiana State Militia, a new unit to be based in Grant Parish to help control the violence there and in other Red, Parish, Red River parishes. Ward, born a slave in 1840 in Charleston, South Carolina, had learned to read and write as a valet to a master in Richmond, Virginia. In 1864, he escaped and went to Fortress Monroe where he joined the Union Army and served un until after General Robert E. Lee surrendered. About 1870, he came to Grant Parish where he had a friend. He quickly became active among local blacks in the Republican Party. After his appointment to the militia, Ward recruited other freedmen for his forces, several of whom were veterans of the war. In Louisiana, Republican Governor Henry Clay Warmoth defected from the Liberal Republicans, a group that opposed President Grant's Reconstruction policy in 1872. Warmoth previously supported a constitutional amendment that allowed their former candidate Confederates, who had been denied the right to vote, to be re-enfranchised. A fusionist co coalition of Liberal Republicans and Democrats dominated ex-Confederate Battalion Commander Democrat John McHenry to succeed him as governor. In return, Democrats and liberal Republicans were sent to, were to send Warmoth to Washington as a U.S. Senator. Opposing McHenry was Republican William Pitt Kellogg. 
one of Louisiana's U.S. Senators, voting on November 4th, 1872, resulted in dual governments as a fusionist, liberal Republicans and Democrat dominated returning board declared McHenry the winner while a faction of the board proclaimed Kellogg the winner. Both administrations held inaugural ceremonies and certified their list of local candidates. After failing to win their case in court, the Kellogg forces appealed to federal judge Edward Durrell in New Orleans to intervene in order that Kellogg and the stalwart Republican majority legislatures would be seated and for grants would authorize U.S. Army troops to protect Kellogg's government. This action was widely criticized across the nation by Democrats and both factions of the Republican Party because it was considered to be a violation of the rights of states to manage their own non-federal office elections. Thus, investigating committees of both chambers of the Federal Congress in Washington were critical of the Kellogg choice. The House majority ruled Durrell's actions illegal and the Senate majority concluded that the Kellogg regime was not much better than a successful conspiracy. In 1874, a House investigating committee in Washington recommended that Judge Durrell be impeached for corruption and illegal, illegally interfering in the U Louisiana 1872 state elections, but the judge resigned in order to avoid impeachment. McHenry's faction tried to take control of the state arsenal at Jackson, state, Jackson Square, but Kellogg had the state militia seize dozens of leaders of McHenry's factions and control New Orleans, where the state government was located. McHenry returned to try to take control with a private paramilitary group. In September 1873, his forces, more than 8,000 strong, entered the city and defeated the city-state militia of about 3,500 in New Orleans. The Democrats took control of the state house, armory, and police stations, where the state government was then located in what was known as the Battle of Jackson Square. His forces held those buildings for three days before retreating before federal troops arrived. Warmoth was subsequently impeached by the state legislature due to a bribery scandal resulting from his actions in the 1872 election. Warmoth appointed Democrats as parish registrars and they ensured the voter rolls included as many whites and as few freemen as possible. A number of registrars changed the registration site without notifying blacks. They also required blacks to prove they were over 21 while knowing that former slaves did not have birth certificates. In Grant Parish, one plantation owner threatened to expel blacks from homes they rented on his land if they voted Republican. Fusionists also tampered with ballot boxes on election day. One was found with a hole in it, apparently used for stuffing the ballot box. As a result, Grant Parish fusionists claimed a landslide victory even though black voters outnumbered whites by 776 to 630. Warmoth issued commissions to fusionist Democrats Alphonse Casabot and Christopher Columbus Nash elected parish judge and sheriff respectively. Like many white men in the South, Nash was a Confederate veteran as an officer. He had been held for a year and a half as a prisoner of war at Johnson's Island in Ohio. Casabot and Nash took their oaths of office in the Colfax Courthouse on January 2nd, 1873. They dispatched the documents to Governor McHenry in New Orleans. William Pitt Kellogg issued commissions to the Republican slate for Grant Parish on January 17th and 18th. By then, Nash and Casabot controlled the small primitive courthouse Republican Robert C. Register, insisted that he, not Alphonse Casabot, was the parish judge and that Republican Daniel Wesley Shaw, not Nash, was to be sheriff. On the night of March 25th, the Republicans seized the empty courthouse and took their oaths of office. They sent their oaths to the Kellogg administration in New Orleans. Grant Parish was one of a number of new parishes created by the Republican government in an effort to increase local control in the state. Both the land and its people were originally associated with the Calhoun family, whose plantation had covered more than the borders of the new parish. The freedmen had been slaves of the plantation. The parish also included the less developed hill country. The total population had a narrow majority of 2,400 freedmen who mostly voted Republican and 2,200 whites who voted as Democrats. Statewide, political tensions were represented in the rumors going around each community, often about white fears of black attacks or outrage which added to local tensions. Fearful that the Democrats might tried to control the local parish government, black people started to create trenches around the courthouse and drill to keep alert. 
The Republican office holders stayed there overnight. They held the town for three weeks. On March 28th, Nash, Kazabot, Hadnot, and other white fusionists called for armed whites to retake the courthouse on April 1st. Whites were recruited from nearby Wynn and surrounding parishes to join their effort. The, Rep the Republican Shaw, Register, and Flowers and others began to collect a posse of armed blacks to defend the courthouse. Black Republicans Louis Meekins and state militia captain William Ward, a black union veteran, raided the homes of the opposition judges. I'm sorry, leaders. Judge William R. Rutland, Bill Cruikshank, and Jim Hadnock. Gunfire erupted between whites and blacks on April 2nd and again on April 5th, but the shotguns were too inaccurate to do any harm. The two sides arranged for peace negotiations. Peace ended when a white man shot and killed a black man named Jesse McKinney, described as a bystander. Another armed conflict on April 6th ended with whites fleeing from armed blacks. With all the unrest in the community, black women and children joined the men at the courthouse for protection. William Ward, the commanding officer of the Company A-6 Infantry Regiment, Louisiana State Militia, headquartered in Grant Parish, had been elected state representative from the parish on the Republican ticket. He wrote to Governor Kellogg seeking U.S. troops for reinforcement and gave the letter to William Smith Calhoun for delivery. Calhoun took the steamboat LaBelle down the Red River but was captured by Paul Ho. Had not in Cruikshank, they ordered Calhoun to tell blacks to leave the courthouse. The black defenders refused to leave although threatened by parties of armed whites commanded by Nash. To recruit men during the rising political tensions, Nash had contributed to lurid rumors that blacks were preparing to kill all the white men and take the white women as their own. On April 8th of the anti-Republican Daily Picayune newspaper of New Orleans, inflamed tensions and distorted events by the following headline, The Riot in Grant Parish, Fearful Atrocities by the Negroes, No Respect Shown to the Dead. Such news attracted more whites from the region to Grant Parish to join Nash. All were experienced Confederate veterans. They acquired a four pound cannon that could fire iron slugs. As the Klansman Dave Paul said, boys, this is a struggle for white supremacy. Suffering from tuberculosis and rheumatism, on April 11th, the militia captain Ward took a steamboat down river to New Orleans to seek armed help directly from Kellogg. He was not there for the following events. Kazabot had directed Nash as sheriff to end what he called a riot. Nash gathered an armed white paramilitary group and veteran officers from Rapids, Wynn, and Catahoula parishes. He did not move his forces toward the courthouse until noon on Easter Sunday, April 13th. Nash commanded more than 300 armed white men, more on horseback and armed with rifles. Nash reportedly ordered the defenders of the courthouse to leave. When that failed, Nash gave women and children camped outside the courthouse 30 minutes to leave. After they left, the shooting began. The fighting continued for several hours with few casualties. When Nash's paramilitary maneuvered the cannon behind the building, some of the defenders panicked and left the courthouse. About 60 defenders ran into nearby woods and jumped into the river. Nash sent men on horseback after fleeing black Republicans and his paramilitary group killed most of them on the spot. Soon, Nash's forces directed a black cat captive to set the courthouse roof afire. The defenders displayed white flags for surrender, one made from a shirt, the other from a page of a book. The shooting stopped. Nash's group approached and called for those surrendering to throw down their weapons and come outside. What happened next is disputed. According to the reports, some white James Hadnot was shot and wounded by someone from the courthouse. In the Negro version, the men in the courthouse were stacking their guns when the white men approached and had not was shot from behind by an overexcited member of his own force, had not died later after being taken down steam by a passing steamboat. In the aftermath of had not shooting, the white paramilitary group reacted with mass murders of the black men. As more than 40 times as many blacks died as did whites historians generally describe the event as a massacre. The white paramilitary group killed unarmed men trying to hide in the courthouse. They rolled down and killed those attempting to flee. They dumped some bodies into the Red River. About 50 blacks survived the afternoon and were taken prisoner. Later that night, they were summarily killed by their captors, who had been drinking alcohol. Only one black man from the group, Levi Nelson, survived. 
He was shot by Cruikshank but managed to crawl away unnoticed. He later served as one of the federal government's chief witnesses against those who were indicted for the attacks. Kellogg sent state militia colonels Theodore Decline and William Wright to Colfax with warrants to arrest 50 white men and to install a new compromised slate of parish officers. Decline and Wright found the smoking ruins of the courthouse at Colfax and many bodies of men who had been shot in the back of the or the of the head or the neck. They described that one body was charred, another man's head beaten beyond recognition, and another had a slashed throat. Surviving blacks told Decline and Wright that blacks dug a trench around the courthouse to protect it from what they saw as an attempt by white Democrats to steal an election. They were attacked by whites armed with rifles, revolvers, and a small cannon. When blacks refused to leave, the courthouse was burned and the black defenders were shot down. While the whites accused blacks of violating a flag of truce and rioting, black Republicans said that none of this was true. They accused whites of marching captured prisoners away in pairs and shooting them in the back of the head. On April 14th, some of Governor Kellogg's new police force arrived from New Orleans. Several days later, two companies of federal troops arrived. They searched for white paramilitary members, but many had already fled to Texas or the hills. The officers filed a military report in which they identified by name three whites and 105 blacks who had died, plus noted they had recovered 15 to 20 unidentified blacks from the river. They also noted the savage nature of many of the killings, suggesting an out-of-control situation. The exact number of dead was never established. Two U.S. Marshals who visited the site on April 15th and buried dead reported 62 fatalities. A military report to Congress in 1875 identified 81 black men by name who had been killed and also estimated that between 15 and 20 bodies had been thrown into the Red River and another 18 were secretly buried for a grand total of at least 105. A state historical marker from 1950 noted fatalities as three whites, three whites and 150 blacks. The historian Eric Foner, a specialist in the Civil War and Reconstruction, wrote about the event. The bloodiest single instance of racial carnage in the Reconstruction era, the Colfax Massacre taught many lessons, including the lengths to which some opponents of Reconstruction would go to regain their accustomed authority. Among blacks in Louisiana, the incident was long remembered as proof that in any large confrontation, they stood at a fatal disadvantage. The organization against them is too strong. Louisiana black teacher and Reconstruction legislature John G. Lewis later remarked, they attempted armed self-defense in Colfax. The result was that on Easter Sunday of 1873, when the sun went down that night, it went down on the corpses of 280 Negroes. James Roswell Beckwith, the U.S. attorney based in New Orleans, sent an urgent telegram about the massacre to the U.S. attorney general. The massacre in Colfax gained headlines on national newspapers from Boston to Chicago. Various government forces spent weeks trying to round up members of the white paramilitaries, and a total of 97 men were indicted. In the end, Beckwith charged nine men and brought them to trial for violations of the Enforcement Act of 1870. It had been designed to provide federal protection for civil rights of freedmen by the 14th Amendment against actions by terrorist, terrorist groups such as the Klan. The men were charged with one murder and charges related to a conspiracy against the rights of freedmen. There were two succeeding trials in 1874. William Burnham Woods presided over the first trial and was sympathetic to the prosecution. Had the men been convicted, they would not have been able to appeal their decision to any appellate court according to the laws of the time. However, Beckworth was unable to secure a conviction. One man was acquitted and a mistrial was declared in the cases of the other eight. In the second trial, three men were found guilty of 16 charges. However, the presiding judge, Joseph Bradley of the United States Supreme Court, dismissed the convictions, ruling that the charges violated the state actor doctrine, failed to prove a racial rationale for the massacre, or were void of vagueness. He ordered that the men be released on bail and they promptly disappeared. When the federal government appealed the case, it was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court as United States versus Cruikshank of 1875. The Supreme Court ruled that the Enforcement Act of 1870, which was based on the Bill of Rights in the 14th Amendment, applied only to actions committed by the state 
in that it did not apply to actions committed by individuals or private conspiracies. This meant that the federal government could not prosecute cases such as the Colfax killings. The court said plaintiffs who believed their rights were abridged had to seek protection from the state. Louisiana did not prosecute any of the perpetrators in the Colfax massacre. Most southern states would not prosecute white men for attacks against freedmen. Thus, enforcement of criminal sanctions under the act ended. The publicity about the Colfax massacre and subsequent Supreme Court ruling encouraged the growth of white paramilitary organizations. In May 1874, Nash formed the first chapter of the White League from his paramilitary group, and chapters soon were formed in other areas of Louisiana, as well as the southern parts of nearby states. Unlike the former KKK, they operated openly and often carried publicly. One historian described them as the military arm of the Democratic Party. Other paramilitary groups such as the Red Shirts also arose, especially in South Carolina and Mississippi, which also had black majorities of population and in certain counties in North Carolina. Paramilitary groups used violence and murder to terrorize leaders among the freedmen and white Republicans, as well as to repress voting among freedmen during the 1870s. Black American citizens had little recourse. In August 1874, for instance, the White League threw out Republican office holders in Cushada Red River Parish, assassinating the six whites before they left the state and killing five to 15 freedmen who were witnesses. For the Four of the white men killed were related to the state representative from the area. Such violence served to intimidate voters and office holders. It was one of the methods that the white Democrats used to gain control of the state legislature in the 1876 elections and ultimately to end Reconstruction in Louisiana. The scale of the massacre and the political conflict it represents are of state and national significance in relation to Reconstruction and United States racial histories. Despite this, the event has been for decades considered a matter of mainly local history. Moreover, the site has changed. Some of the areas have been paved and the old courthouse was demolished and a new courthouse was built. Finally, without archaeological work to establish where victims were buried at the site, people have had difficulty defining a site to gain approval for a historical memorial. In 1920, a committee met in Colfax to pur purchase a monument to memorialize the three white men who died. This monument stands in Colfax Cemetery and reads, Erected to the memory of the heroes Stephen DeGuerre Parish, James West Hadnot, Sidney Harris, who fell in the Colfax rioting riot fighting for white supremacy. In 1950, Louisiana erected a state highway marker noting the event of 1873 as the Colfax Riot, as the event was a traditionally known by the white community. The marker states, on this site occurred the Colfax Riot, in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. This event on April 13, 1873 marked the end of a carpetbag misrule in the South. The marker was removed on May 15, 2021 for eventual placement in a museum. The Colfax Massacre is among the events of the Reconstruction in late 19th century history which have received new national attention during the early 21st century much as the 1923 massacre in Rosewood, Florida did near the end of the 20th century. In 2007 and 2008, two new books were published on the topic. Deanna Keats, The Colfax Massacre, The Untold Story of Black Power, White Terror, and the Death of Reconstruction, and Charles Lane's The Day Freedom Died, The Colfax Massacre, The Supreme Court, and the Betrayal of Reconstruction. Lane especially addressed the political and legal implications of the Supreme Court case, which derived from the prosecution of several men of the white paramilitary groups. In addition, a film documentary is in preparation. In 2007, the Red River Heritage Association Incorporated was formed as a group intending to establish a museum in Colfax for collecting materials and interpreting the history of Reconstruction in Louisiana and especially the Red River area. In 2008, on the 135th anniversary of the Colfax Massacre, an interracial group commemorated the event. They laid flowers where some victims had fallen and held a forum to discuss the history. In 2021, a state highway marker was removed, which had been erected in 1950 in Louisiana, noting the event of 1873 as the Colfax Riot as the event was traditionally known in the white community. Wow, that was a lot of information right there concerning this particular massacre, riot, however you want to call it. This is so far actually my longest episode. We're at the 30 minute mark, but 
I hope you learned something new from this as this is going to conclude episode 9 of the Black Massacre series, the Kofax Riot Massacre of 1873. Make sure if you have not done so already to check out the previous episodes. They are in the Black Massacre series playlist. Stay tuned as I will be back again next week where we will do episode 10 of the Black Massacre series. Stay safe and be one.